Hello everyone and welcome to our eighth session on the Coventry University uh, Geography webinar series. Um, this week we have Dr Amber Martin Woodhead, who's going to be doing a really interesting talk on the geography of the fashion, the social and environmental costs of fast fashion. So um, Amber has been with us since 2016 in the department and she's done some really interesting work particularly with an economic geography and um, specialises in sustainable uh, fashion and also sustainable consumption. And what I think is really nice about this talk is that she'll be offering a more focused approach to some of the ideas that I talked about a few weeks ago in regards to population consumption um, and focusing primarily here on, on the fashion trade. Um, Amber was a lecturer as well at um, Queen Mary before she joined us and also worked in marketing within L'Oreal. So a really varied career and um, some really interesting um, experiences and insights that hopefully she'll share with you um, today in her talk. Um, just to plug a few um, things as well beforehand, um, we do have our next webinar obviously next Wednesday again, again at 4.30. And that is with um, Dr. Michelle Farrell. And she'll be looking at what we can learn from the Earth's natural experiments in climate change. So that should be a really interesting talk as well. Um, again, it'll be here on our um, webinar platform for you to join. And if you're interested in being part of our mailing list, this is particularly for teachers. Um, do get in touch with my colleague, um, Dr. Perry Glashford, and you can contact him via the email address, perry.lashford at coventry.ac.uk. Um, so I'll leave the platform open to Amber now. There'll be opportunity for questions uh, throughout. So I think Amber's second slide um, has the QR code here for you to um, join, or you can use the Menti code um, number there as well. Um, and this will be available at the end. I know some of you have had difficulties before accessing this um, if you're watching this by your phone. So this will be made available at the end as well. Okay, thank you, Amber. I'll, I'll leave it up to you then. The floor is yours. Thank you, <laughs> thank you ever so much, Jade. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Very kind of you. Um, and um, welcome everyone today uh, for this lecture that I'm going to be doing on the geographies of fashion. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. It's something that I've put together based on a course that I run at Coventry University. I run a second year course called Shop Till You Drop, The Geographies of Consumption. And uh, I do quite a few lectures on the geographies of fashion. And here I don't have as long as I normally have for the several lectures I normally do on this, but I'm gonna hopefully provide a little bit of a, a whistle stop tour of um, the, some of the main issues surrounding uh, the geographies of fashion. So when I tell people I do human geography and I'm a lecturer in human geography, often they go to me, oh, oh is that to do with population and stuff like that? And I'm sure you get this all as well, you know, doing um, A-level geography. And it can be very, very hard sometimes to explain to them that um, actually I do a lot of work on fashion and geography because people go oh fashion geography those two things don't mix and I'm hopefully by the end of this um, talk today I will be able to really have shown you just how intricate fashion and geography really are and I don't blame people for not really um, knowing much about this kind of interweaving of uh, fashion and geography because geographers themselves have come to this study of fashion uh, reasonably late on in our disciplinary history. Fashion has not wasn't really originally studied by geographers. Um, it was often seen as somehow, somehow uh, frivolous, unimportant, um, which hopefully by the end of the talk today you'll um, be like, yes, it's very much uh, an important topic that we really need to be considering more. And I think uh, the main associations between fashion and geography were, you know, the idea of uh, geography teachers in tweed suits and dodgy elbow patches. But hopefully uh, that's that's changed over the course of uh, the last couple of decades. And people used to think about it as just, you know, students going around with clipboards and shopping centres. But we have very much moved on. And now within geography, and the, uh, we really acknowledge the huge significance of fashion and the global fashion industry, which just gets bigger and bigger. 
And this is a picture of my PhD supervisor, Professor Louise Crew, who's one of the main uh, people who study geography and fashion. If you're interested, she's got a fantastic book out called The Geographies of Fashion, which you might find interesting. And there's just this lovely quote from her here. It says, fashion is one of the most global and simultaneously one of the most intimate, so the close of commodities, that's just a fancy word for things. And it says, its chains of sourcing, production, supply and consumption span, unite and divide every imaginable geographical scale from the global world to the space of the body. So it's a highly, highly geographical topic. And but people don't always think about this. They will think about their clothes and think, well, what on earth is geographical about this? But how often do we really think about where our clothes come from? And if you think about what you're wearing right now, you would be able to find out by having a look at some made in labels, for example. And um, all the people watching today, there'll be clothes made from all across the globe. And even then, the maiden label doesn't give us a huge amount of detail of exactly when, you know, where the cotton came from, where the thread came from, where the rivets came from for our jeans. There's these huge global assemblage networks just in a simple piece of clothing. And there's a lovely uh, quote here again from Louise Cruz saying, we all wear clothes, but how often do we reflect upon who made these clothes? Where and under what conditions? And if our clothes could talk, what geographical stories would they tell? So I'm going to try and construct a bit of a geographical story for you today, thinking about the geographical stories of our clothes and why they matter to geographers. And to set this up, I have to give you a big introduction, really, to the state of fashion as we know it presently and really the rise of fast fashion. So fashion has changed very much, particularly over the last few decades. And it used to be um, before the 1990s, there used to be fashion cycles. So spring, summer, autumn, winter, these were the big times for fashion collections. But then things began to shift. So it would be the manufacturer would make, you know, the spring, summer wardrobes, the autumn, winter wardrobes. But then that all started to change. So the beginning of the 1990s, more seasons started creeping in. And you'd find that as you'd go into shops, there would be a faster turnaround of clothing more and more frequently. And it turned into fast fashion cycles, which are actually typically about 52 cycles per year. So there'll be new deliveries of new, a new season's clothing in a, a kind of standard high street fast fashion retailer weekly, not monthly. And you could even argue that there's this with a shift to online fashion and the rise of these massive big online fast fashion retailers like Boohoo, ASOS, Pretty Little Things. Um, this is almost an instant fashion because people see things on Instagram and then they can click on it and say, oh, yeah, that's where that comes from and just order it and it'll be with you the next day. So we've almost, I'd argue, there's this shift on not just fast fashion, but ever faster fashion or instant fashion as well. What fast fashion does is it can often promote purchase. So in the very nature of what fast fashion is helps promote people to buy more. So by saying something's only going to be in store or online for a certain amount of time, that promotes a sense of urgency. We all know those things where they say, oh, it's on sale for limited time only. There's therefore more pressure almost put on consumers to go, oh, well, I better get it now. So by offering these um, designs in a kind of short space of time, it ensures this kind of strange sense of exclusivity and really encourages people to purchase more and more because it's that man mentality of if it's here today, you know, gone tomorrow, so you've got to get it now before you lose out. And it has been argued that because of this uh, mentality around fast fashion and buying lots and lots of things, it's challenging that idea of want versus need in our the things and the clothes that we buy as tending uh, as a, a kind of Western economy to be buying a lot more clothes than we actually really need to be wearing. And fast fashion and this idea of always wearing new clothes is very much becoming the norm. Uh, there's a really good uh, paper on this that argues it's not just fast fashion, they'd argue it's almost throwaway fashion now, because there's this mentality in which it's seen that 
we all need to be wearing new clothes and we can't be seen the same thing twice and the vast rise of social media hasn't helped this as people sometimes don't want to be pictured in the same picture twice because there's always this photographic record almost of people's lives so this is encouraging this increased turnaround of clothing and what that then does is it actively just encourages people to discard or get rid of old styles um, before they've actually worn out as well. So there's this lovely image here. I've taken this from a Fashion Revolution um, magazine and it's lovely this idea of fashion having a best before date and this idea that you know we, we shouldn't think of fashion as disposable but unfortunately it's it is almost a kind of throwaway fashion market now. Another issue with this is planned obsolescence and um, the strangest thing about a lot of the things that uh, we buy sort of standard fashion items are not made to last us a lifetime. So in the time of generations before us, when you bought something, it was expected to last you a long time. And by a long time, I don't mean a year. I mean, you know, it could be decades. I've, I've inherited some coats from my um, grandmother that are still going. And it was just, they were just made in a very different time. Whereas now, if you buy something from a kind of standard fast fashion retailer, there's a 10 wash benchmark, which is often used by fast fashion retailers, where an item isn't really expected to maintain the newness, you know, when you get something new and it looks nice and there's no bubbles on it and there's no pulls in it. And it's not designed to last necessarily more than 10 washes. Um, it's designed to be manufactured not very well. It's not designed as a quality project that's made to last. It's designed essentially to fall apart. Um, so we see this issue of planned obsolescence in fashion, just as we do in the rise of technology that has planned obsolescence. But that's another lecture idea. I won't stop talking about that now. So as geographers, we're really interested in the changing geographies of the global fashion industry and why this has really occurred. So why has fast fashion happened? And this is where a kind of economic geography perspective really comes in here, because it's all to do with globalisation. And I'm sure that's something a lot of you um, will have looked at um, during your A-level. So I'm not going to talk too much about it today, but as an overview or a snapshot, really since the end of the 1960s, we've seen this mass internationalization of the world economy with the reloca uh, relocation of primary manufacture that we'd have once seen, say, in the UK in the Industrial Revolution um, around the 18th century onwards towards the outsourcing of primary manufacture to um, cheaper labour areas. And by cheaper la uh, labour areas, I'm talking about um, parts of the world such as the Asian um, tiger economies. Here I've got an example of a factory in the export processing zone of Bangladesh. And I'll be, you'll notice Bangladesh is a sort of country that I, I touch upon quite a lot throughout this talk, because it's one of the primary producers of fashion for the whole globe. And we've seen the rise of massive transnational uh, corporations making the most of this cheaper labour elsewhere. And it is an awful lot cheaper to have things made, say, in Bangladesh than it is to have made in the UK. Clothes are still made in the UK sometimes, but a huge amount of global outsourcing happens. And this has occurred because of the advances of uh, travel, transportation and technology enabled by globalisation. So we are able to manufacture clothing, fashion garments across the globe. The raw materials can be sourced across the globe and transported to places of manufacture and then uh, transported to retailers. And you can still have a relatively quick product turnaround uh, in the fast fashion industry, despite the actual long geographical distances. Something that um, very famous geographer David Harvey calls time space compression. It's the idea that even though we might be, say, thousands of miles away from uh, a country like Bangladesh, actually, we're still geographically, figuratively quite close because of the rise of air travel that enables us to import goods or via freight. And all this has meant that we now have an increasingly uneven geography to our uh, to the clothing industry. And 
I love this map. Unfortunately, it's a little bit dated now, but they haven't um, provided uh, an updated one uh, recently, but I still use it because I think it still um, is relevant and shows the main uh, key points here. This is a, a special map that shows distortion according to the amount of imports of a country. So the countries that are blown up to show that they're larger are the ones that are importing the uh, majority of the world's clothing. So you might not be able to make this out, but if you can, you can see here we've got North America and the UK right there, that's uh, the UK in the middle there and Western Europe and Japan is the purple country on the right. And so we can see South America and Africa and Indonesia all squeezed up because they're not the ones importing the clothes. Uh, it's the global north in which all these countries are uh, importing all their clothes. And conversely, we see a very other, uh, another kind of very mixed geography here in which we see the countries that export the most clothes. And suddenly um, the Asian economies and Asian countries sort of blow up in size because they're the ones that are exporting all our clothes. So it's the Eastern Asian um, economies here that we're seeing. Uh, China, Indonesia, Bangladesh, India, huge exporters of clothes and also Eastern Europe as well. So there's this really strange, uneven geography going on here. And what it means is that consumers predominantly say in the global north, so I'm talking about Western economies like the UK, Japan, the USA, Western Europe, are suddenly becoming further and further distance from their clothes because clothes are being made further and further away. And this leads me to the next point in this talk, uh, which draws upon or has a very human geography angle in which I'm going to be looking at the human costs of the fast fashion industry, because as we've seen increased globalization of in the world of fashion with all the things that people are wearing being made further and further away, that has encouraged there to be even further issues along those global production chains. And to quote Louise Crew again here, uh, she argues that the spaces in which fashions are sewn are just as important as the spaces in which they're advertised, modelled and purchased, um, which is how you normally think about clothes. And we need to think about um, basically ethical fashion, which is something I will talk about towards the end of this talk. So this is where human geographers might get really interested in the fashion industry. And I'm gonna be talking about why that might, why it matters to human geographers. And I was talking about the global outsourcing of production is all to do with cost. And I think this breakdown costs of how much a t-shirt costs and where all the money goes really illustrates this nicely. So again, this is from Fashion Revolution. I'll be talking more about who they are and what they do later on in the talk. And what they've done here is created a very simple cost breakdown of a, a standard 29 euro t-shirt. So they've done it in euros. And you can see here, they've done it very cleverly like a graph. And the largest area is, is the retail market, a uh, markup, sorry, about $17. And then we've got in purple here, the brand margin about $3. So that's the money that um, goes to the brand, costs about $2 to transport it. Uh, the manufacturing costs are still relatively small at uh, $3.40. But the thing I really want to draw your attention to here is, uh, number four, the labour, what is paid to the people that have produced this standard T-shirt, you know, one we all have in our cupboards, 18 cents of a euro. So not even a full euro for this cost of this one T-shirt. And Fashion Revolution argued that you could increase that wage to just 0.45 cents of a euro and give that to garment workers to get a living wage. So what would be a reasonable amount of a living wage? You might have heard about there's been quite a lot of um, stuff about living wage in, in the press and the media about uh, the London living wage, for example. So. People making our clothes are predominantly not getting paid huge amounts, not for all clothing, but uh, for an awful lot of the things that we buy. £48.44, so just under 50 quid. That is the monthly payment that you would get if you were working in a garment factory in Bangladesh. And I'm not talking about a uh, 
you know, that kind of stereotypical notion of a sweatshop that you might um, kind of be familiar with. And um, this is uh, the standard, you know, fully legitimate uh, garment factory uh, that's, you know, regulated. That's that's the wage, that's the standard wage. And this kind of legal minimum wage, however, that is given is actually still very much not a living wage. And just to contextualize that, Fashion Revolution um, argue that is approximately a quarter of what you'd need um, for, to have a living wage if you were living in Bangladesh. And to give it some context of how little people in the garment factory are paid, that's about uh, road sweepers get paid £139.39 a month on average, that's the monthly minimum wage. So you can see here there's this huge disparity and a worryingly low amount being paid uh, to many garment workers across the world. And the really worrying thing is that's in, you know, the good factories, the one that's, you know, that are actually giving a minimum wage. One thing that is a huge issue within the global fashion industry is the illegal, essentially, sweatshop economy, which exists in many uh, developing countries across the world. Um, illegal sweatshops occur because even though uh, often you see now, if you go onto fashion retailers websites, they talk a lot about transparency. And you can eat, they often have maps where you can look at where all their factories are across the globe as this idea of transparency. Um, one issue that occurs is because of the increasingly high demands for such high outputs in such quick turnaround times to these factories, illegal, essentially illegal outsourcing can occur. So they might go, oh, yes, of course, we can, we can make that for you, but actually we can't. So we're going to have to outsource some of that to some uh, less regulated factories, shall we say. And this is a form of subcontracting. Uh, so unregulated sweatshops, people um, making uh, clothing in just informally in their homes as well. And uh, this uh, is a picture from a series of photographs that was taken. If you have a look at the link there, it was a Beyond the Label, it's by an artist who took some amazing photos of these sorts of informal uh, garment factories in Dhaka in Bangladesh in 2015. And some of the images really are quite harrowing. So we can see here, obviously, these very um, young boys um, working in this um, informal uh, garment factory. And um, just going back to uh, Louise Cruz's paper again, um, she talks about how Bangladesh really has the cheapest garment workers in the world, working the longest hours and living in the most crowded and unsanitary slums. So it's a really big problem. If you'd like to know a little bit more about this, oh, excuse me, um, I really recommend a very easily accessible book by Safia Mini called Slave to Fashion. Uh, I think you can get it on Amazon for, it's not too expensive, um, or you might be able to get it through school or maybe a library if, if you're interested. It's a, she is the founder of People Tree, which is a, an ethical and sustainable fashion brand who I'll talk a little bit about later. And she's written this very, very uh, accessible book about some of the main issues uh, within the fashion industry in terms of uh, modern slavery. And she talks uh, about the very serious conditions of forced and excessive labour uh, within the fashion industry. Think the kind of working conditions I think a lot of people maybe in the UK would just find incomprehensible. So I'm not just talking some long hours, kind of 60 to 77 hours a week with no day off in India. So that's the equivalent of working from nine o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night every day of the week. Um, with ongoing issues of intimidation and sexual harassment. And she gives some really good examples and uh, stories of kind of everyday people's lives uh, throughout this book. And she also talks about this issue of bonded labour, um, which is another form of modern slavery, in which people are enlisted into garment factories um, in, for a loan, so they might get moved somewhere, for example. Um, there are some quite serious issues of this um, happens with Chinese migrants going into Tuscany in Italy um, to these garment factories, and they're sort of advertised, and you know, they say, oh, we, we, you can pay us back kind of thing. But then the value of the work that's then done will never exceed the money borrowed so essentially people become slaves to these garment factories which is incredibly sad and a very serious issue and of course um, 
one of the most serious issues within um, uh, the fashion industry is child labour. Um, there's this is a, a picture from the Slave to Fashion book of um, a little girl and other children um, making bangles uh, near Delhi um, as a supplement for family income as well. So this is again this idea of informal economies and um, people being enlisted onto that and something uh, things like bangle making and things with sequins and anything with beads and things like that is often a form of thing something that gets illegally subcontracted because it's all hand done and it takes so long to do. This is a picture of Rana Plaza. If you haven't come across this before, uh, this is a huge, this was probably one of the most significant moments um, within the fashion industry in the last decade because it was a terrible disaster that happened uh, in Bangladesh uh, where this factory collapsed and uh, over a thousand people died in, and it was making it the fourth largest industrial disaster ever in history. And one of the saddest things about it is that the cracks in the building started appearing the day before this collapse happened and the shops and the banks in this kind of complex were closed immediately, but there were five garment factories inside that were forced to keep working um, due to the demands of these huge demands of these uh, uh, fashion retailers and they were producing garments for European and North American markets with some big brands um, you would have all known. And the reason I put this slide on here is because it's so significant because it really uh, started to encourage people to think about uh, the fashion industry and the difficulties people have working within it across the globe. And it started this increased discourse of people really thinking about and talking about um, fashion and the difficulties of working in the fashion industry. And it's something, of course, as human geographers, we're very, very interested in, um, in terms of uh, uneven geographies and the difficulties people might face in their everyday lives. So unfortunately, there are some, <laughs> it's not the prettiest picture. Um, sometimes you think, oh, yeah, it's going to be a lecture about fashion. It's going to be really fun. And like, yeah, I've just bummed everyone out. Um, but uh, hopefully, don't worry, I will talk in some more positive things to do with the fashion industry towards the end of the talk. Now, of course, as geographers, uh, we're interested in human interactions with the environment. And this is where the kind of the blurring here between human and physical geography becomes really interesting when we start thinking about fashion, because of course, we're all becoming a lot more aware of the huge environmental costs of fashion. And probably uh, for your generation, it's not a huge surprise that, yes, we know a lot about this. And it's, you know, something that's in the media a lot and it's something you'll, you'll know about. Um, whereas uh, when sort of I, I was growing up, this wasn't really something that people talked about as much. And when I went to uh, do my uh, undergraduate at Nottingham, um, it was only really in my third year when I did this module um, the, on fashion and, and geography, that it really sort of opened my eyes to all this uh, this stuff I had no idea that was was going on. So unfortunately, you could do an entire module really on the environmental difficulties of the fashion industry, and I don't have time to do that now. But I do have time to give you a little bit of a whistle stop tour of some of the issues uh, that, that exist within the fashion industry in terms of the environmental impact of our clothing. So I often ask people this question, I ask my students, how many litres of water does it take to produce a single cotton t-shirt? And sometimes they look at me and they're really confused because they're like, Amber, how, how water, like what's water got to do with a t-shirt? Um, it has a lot to do with a t-shirt. Um, our clothes take up a huge amount of water and how they're produced. It actually takes 2,700 litres to make one cotton t-shirt. So that's enough drinking water for one person, but for two and a half years. So it's an awful lot of water that it takes just to produce one garment. So I dread to think if you worked it out for someone's entire wardrobe, how much water it would take up. And you might be thinking, but why? Like why on earth does clothing take up water? And it's because of this. 
If you're not familiar with this plant, this is a cotton plant and that is incredibly beautiful and people use them now in, you know, really modern uh, uh, flower displays and things like that. And it's, it really is a beautiful, beautiful plant. And you can see here how that you can create cotton from these the fluffy bits. It looks like balls of cotton wool, like balls of cotton wool. And this is uh, processed and woven into thread, which makes cotton like you'd see on a cotton reel. And this is what an awful lot of our clothes is made from, cotton. Sounds so lovely, natural, people think, yeah, well, it's cotton, you know, it's not as bad as buying polyester or something like that, which is essentially woven plastic. <laughs> um, it's a form of plastic, it takes about 200 years to biodegrade. So cotton, that's surely better. Yes and no. <laughs> um, definitely better than polyester in terms of, you know, it not being a plastic. However, this plant, beautiful it though it is, is incredibly thirsty. And this plant needs an awful lot of water. It also tends to grow in very hot regions of the world. So a lot to do with Uzbekistan, India has huge amounts of cotton production. And in order to grow it, it needs lots and lots of water. And I'm not talking about, you know, someone going around with a watering can, I'm saying huge irrigation systems here um, that are needed to produce it. And then of course, as well, once you've made the thread and you've woven it into fabric, if you want that fabric to be another color other than a sort of off-white, which most people do, it's then dyed and that creates lots and lots of issues in terms of uh, the amount of water that's used in that process and also chemical dyes getting into waterways and things like that. So there's quite a lot. If you want to know more about that, you can happily have a Google away and there'll be lots of stuff about um, uh, that online. Just to give you an example of quite how much water cotton requires is a classic example um, used is the Aral Sea. Now if any of you watched um, BBC there was a really good documentary on fashion with Stacey Dooley on BBC a, a year or two a couple of years ago now it might still be on there and she went to the Aral Sea and basically drove through it. Um, so there's an awful lot of cotton production that happens in Uzbekistan uh, if you have a look on the maps here, you can see the lovely green bits below the Aral Sea and how they've changed over time. So they seem to all be doing OK. However, the Aral Sea does not. And it has been gradually shrinking away and being dried up. It used to be one of the largest areas of water in the world. But uh, the water hasn't magically been disappearing. It's because it's been irrigated and transported to uh, basically feed water or these cotton fields uh, that are below it. So it's a very serious situation and one that is obviously highly geographical and of interest uh, to uh, physical and human geographers alike. The other thing with cotton is, is that most of the world's cotton that's produced is not organic and 10% of all the pesticides used in the world and over 20% of insecticides are used on cotton. And again, I'm not talking about a little spray bottle here, I'm talking about you know mass sweeps of fields. This is um, an example of uh, crops being uh, sprayed with pesticides, insecticides as well. So we've got all this chemical use going on in the production of cotton. So often it's a really interesting one, cotton, because you see it being advertised as green and natural, which, which it is, is a natural product. But we don't always think about that it can have a huge amount of environmental harm. Do be careful uh, as well. Uh, if you see something with the label organic cotton, make sure you read the label really, really carefully and make sure it has this. This is the Global Organic Textile Standard or GOTS symbol. And it's actually quite rare to find organic cotton with this label. And it's the, it's the proper symbol that means that it is a truly organic and it's 100% you know, organic uh, piece of clothing. And uh, this is an excerpt actually from the People Tree website, which is really interesting because it's talking about how, unlike food, clothing products actually don't have to be certified to be described as organic. So you might get a cotton t-shirt that says it's from organic cotton, but actually it might have only a few percent 
uh, or a few percent of it is actually made up of um, organic cotton and the rest could just be regular cotton or it's not sort of organic to the uh, standard of got certified so do be a little bit careful with that one as well and look, look for this symbol if you are buying organic cotton okay so now I've just discussed for a while um, let's talk about Another issue uh, in terms of our carbon footprint of our clothing. So I've talked a lot about globalization, how our clothes are getting further and further away. And just as we often think about our carbon footprints when we're going, or when we used to go on planes and holidays and things like that, we think a lot about that in terms of food. So you might have come across the term food miles and thinking about you know the miles that all our you know vegetables have, have taken as they're transported across the globe but i often like to think about the term fashion miles because if our clothes are being globally outsourced across the globe they're having a carbon footprint in the very fact that they've traveled from a place of manufacture to a place in which they're sold and don't forget for something like a pair of jeans that will have a geographical story to tell across the entire world the cotton might have come from uzbekistan it might have been made into thread into india the rivets might be from tunisia it might have been um, put together in china and then stonewashed in turkey before being finally sold in north america so clothes can have these really um, almost untraceable geographical stories and build up all these air miles along the way. And um, I think this is a really fantastic photo. It's from a, a special design. You can see the link at the top and it was for the um, World Wildlife Foundation. And it's talking about how, you know, if something comes from the Philippines that's got 6,839 air miles on it so it's I like the idea of sort of raising awareness that all our clothing has this kind of innate karma footprint because it comes from so far away often and then of course so we've talked about some of the things in manufacturing and some of those issues with just one one fabric cotton and you know getting it to the store and the carbon footprint and of course it arrives in a store and one of the things I'm really interested in um, is uh, retail environments and we look a lot in geography and about uh, how retail environments are created to encourage us to buy things basically how stores have this very specific geography and when we're in this shop you know maybe looking at a t-shirt we're thinking at like about the cool chairs and the funky lights and we're not necessarily thinking oh I wonder who produced this and under what conditions and I wonder what the um, carbon footprint is of this um, this pair of jeans and things like that. One of the issues of course environmentally is clothes and shopping centres and shopping malls have huge amounts of energy that go into them lighting them and heating them and things like that and there's even almost these kind of hidden issues here about um plastic hangers so when we hang up clothes and you know all in stores plastic hangers there's a really good article about this as uh, plastic ha hangers is the fashion industry's almost like dirty secret because plastic hangers cannot be recycled um, unless they're specially designed and the majority of them can't be recycled so every time you buy something you essentially there's this thing that could very much just end up in landfill because often we don't always want them or need them so an another issue there and one of course that we can't forget is with the rise of massive online fashion retailers in which you know we're getting more and more popular particularly over lockdown that was something that people saw of course we saw a lot of uh, the high street retailers like arcadia group collapse and then the huge uh, surge in people buying things online and whenever we buy clothes online, then there's that additional layer of wrapping. So often if you buy clothes, they'll come in sort of maybe tissue paper, depends how if you're getting it somewhere posh, and then like layers of plastic and then in a box as well. And often things can be recycled, but sometimes they can't. And even if they can, they're not always recycled. So there's this really big increased issue of packaging and waste. That's not even just like the carbon footprint of the carbon itself, but of the package that it comes in as well. And so we're wearing our clothes and we might have them in our lives for a long time, we might not. And unfortunately, because of the rise of fast fashion and linking to that idea of planned obsolescence and basically things being made not to last, where does it go? Um, it can go in the, the bottom of your wardrobe and remain unseen for several years. It, can, it might end up in a charity shop if it's still in good nick. But the 
probably uh, the worst thing that can happen to it, when which often does, is it'll go in the bin. Or, and um, every year, this is a quite terrifying statistic, um, UK families throw away over 300,000 tonnes of clothing, which equates to about £140 million pounds worth of clothes. Um, it's a lot more in America. 10.5 million tonnes of clothing that textiles are buried every year. Um, and landfill is becoming an increasing um, problem. If you're interested in things like this, I, I recommend uh, looking at uh, the RAP uh, website, just type in RAP in Google, and they have some really interesting reports about fashion and food and where it all goes. And they did this little study, well, quite a big study really, of where um, all our clothes ended up in the UK. And so, Good news is that 14% ends up being reused, 34% gets sent overseas. That's another lecture in itself, I'm afraid I can't go into that today. Um, but 14% uh, gets recycled, 7% just gets burnt and in, in, incinerated, and 30% or 31% ends up in landfill. So for every three t-shirts that go off the shelf, one is going to end up in landfill, um, which is really worrying and becoming increasingly uh, difficult. And the real issue is so many of the textiles that are made contain things like polyester, uh, which is a form of plastic that just doesn't decompose. And if it does, it takes hundreds and hundreds of years. So unfortunately, there'll be uh, all this plastic in landfills that's going to outlive uh, all of us um, because it just lasts a really long time. Um, which is obviously a problem. So now I've depressed everyone about the state of the fashion industry, I'd like to try and uh, end towards on a, a lighter note because as geographers, we, of course, we need to point out what the problems are in the globe. And these, this is the fashion industry is a huge global problem, both in terms of the human costs and uh, the environmental costs of fashion. But it's also one of our jobs as geographers to look at solutions and look for ways in which we can tackle some of these problems. And there is an increasing popularity or a turn towards sustainable and ethical fashion. We all wear clothes, we all need to wear clothes, um, but it's working out a way that that can be done in a more sustainable way from the current system that we're in. And um, people throw around the terms kind of ethical and sustainable fashion, but just, um, just to clarify, if you hear the term ethical and um, ethical fashion, that's really concerned with the kind of the human geography element of what we've been talking about today. So concerned with people, basically, making sure that people have safe working conditions, good amounts of play, you know, employee rights and welfare uh, with relation to buying clothes. And so, for example, uh, a fair trade logo, you might be very well aware that you can get fair trade food or you can get fair trade fashion as well. And sustainability, so sustainable fashion, that term tends to relate to the environmental side of our garments. So it's mainly associated with the use of things like natural resources that don't have such a high environmental impact upon the planet. So you might see, you know, like I was saying about the GOT certified cotton or the soil association organic and people washing things at lower temperatures and things like that. That's to do with the sustainable side of fashion. And we are seeing a big rise of ethical and sustainable fashion retailers. Um, lots of bigger, bigger brands are kind of trying to like jump on the bandwagon and they might have sustainable lines and things like that. Or sometimes a little bit questionable about how good they are. Um, I do pretty much a whole lecture all about that um, in, in Seth for the second years. Um, but there is an increasing amount of kind of solely um, ethical, sustainable fashion brands. I'm afraid, sadly, I can't take uh, talk about them all, but I will. I'll do a choice couple. Um, People Tree, this one here in the middle towards the right, is the one run by Safia Mini. Um, if you check them out, they do fair trade, sustainable um, products as well. Um, so that's quite interesting. And if you are, you know, someone that is very interested in this, I would really strongly recommend checking out uh, the Ethical Consumer website, ethicalconsumer.org. And they have a whole section on fashion clothing 
And they talk a lot about the difficulties of the fashion industry, but they actually um, do all these um, quite helpful analyses of different companies and how ethical they are. So if you are thinking about, you know, making more kind of ethical consumer decisions, that's a really good place to start. One company I will talk about is Patagonia, which is an American company and started in 1973 in California. And they're really renowned for their focus on sustainable and ethical fashion. I've got a little excerpt here from their website, which is things like they sell t-shirts, for example, um, whereas this t-shirt, yes, it's plastic, it's made with polyester, but it's a 100% recycled t-shirt. So it's made from plastic bottles, it's made from fabric, scraps and it's safe water and it's also got a fair trade certification as well so they call it a uh, responsibility which I think is quite nice as well. Another thing uh, that Patagonia do is they try and shift away from this concept of fast fashion and you know wear it today chuck it out tomorrow kind of thing and they have this element of their business where uh, called worn wear where they actively encourage you to send garments in that you bought from them so that they can be repaired um, because it's so important that we learn to repair our clothes so that they don't go in the bin so that's an example of something they're doing to try and prolong the lives of our things or our clothes in particular a slightly more quirky example is this uh, company uh, Bello and I met some uh, one of the founders of this company while I was at an ethical fashion event and I, I was lucky enough to be able to interview her about her business and it's absolutely fascinating what they do. They're based their production in Brazil and in Brazil they have rules around when your seat belts in your car are a certain number of years old you basically have to ditch them they have to be replaced. So there are all these problems with this, you know, this seatbelt material, which is like this really strong, I'm not sure if it's plastic, but it doesn't look like something that would decompose very easily in landfill being chucked away. And so what this company do is they re-salvage all these new seatbelts and make fashion from them. They, use, they make lots of um, handbags and bags and satchels and things like that. And um, they're talking about here how they saved all these plastic bottles and all these meters of seat belts, and also they use uh, they reuse uh, recycled old fabric as well to make these handbags and bags made out of seat belts, which I just think is really cool. Um, another area that they go down, you'll notice here on the right, you, there's this slightly odd fabric lining that's that brown fabric. It, you might think it's cord or something like that. It's actually something called Pinatex. Pinatex, have a guess, what might it be made from? Pineapples, which I just think is fantastic. So Pinatex, and Google it, look it up, it's really interesting, is a way of making a fabric from the leaves of pineapples. So when you buy a pineapple in the supermarket, you, know, you get all the spring leaves and they're all really beautiful. And well, what would normally happen to those which get chopped away or well, they're not sent with the pineapple and they just don't go to any use and they've developed this system of using the natural text uh, the natural fibers in the pineapple leaves to create um, and dry it all out and then create this this fabric um, which is a really interesting and innovative use of natural resources that would have gone to waste so we're seeing this rise of um, new fabrics, fabrics being made out of um, old, uh, old things, of things that uh, would have gone to waste. But we're also seeing increased consumer awareness, action and activism before um, uh, towards the fashion industry. Of course, one of the most obvious examples is Extinction Rebellion. Of course, you know, the fast fashion industry it wouldn't get away from wouldn't get away from some of their you know, ideas about climate change. Um, this is just a really interesting, um, a very um, kind of strongly emotive uh, protest where they held a, like a funeral for the fashion industry uh, during London Fashion Week in uh, 2019. So we're seeing increasing amount of awareness and protests about the fashion industry and lots of uh, people trying to really make a difference. Fashion revolution 
if you are in, really interested in, you know, fashion and ethical fashion, do check out their website. Fashion Revolution really started after the collapse of Rana Plaza, and they created um, a kind of a week um, every year uh, during the anniversary around April, so Fashion Revolution Week, where they do a lot of promotions about asking people to ask their retailers essentially about who made their clothes so they started this campaign of who made your clothes and people would put up like the signs of saying who made my clothes and they'd send it to H&M they'd send it to Zara they send it to Boohoo and to try and encourage big fashion retailers to encourage this idea of uh, transparency because fashion revolution argued that if companies and big fast fashion retailers are transparent, i.e. we know what's happening in their supply chains, that means that they will hopefully be more accountable. And if someone's more accountable, that might in, um, enact some sort of change. So they really encourage uh, fashion retailers to be more transparent and they have lots of really interesting reports and they create like I've used some of the shots from her in this lecture they create all these really nice visuals and it's very easy to get into and digest so I would really recommend looking at that. One of the most important things um, in terms of changes to the fast fashion industry at least I think from um, I believe is about individual people and consumers because ultimately if people aren't clicking buy on a fast fashion retailer's website, they're not gonna sell as much. And it, there is a huge power in collective action of individuals. And there's lots of things that we can do on an everyday basis to help counteract some of the issues of the fashion industry. You might have heard of the slow food movement, but the slow fashion movement has become increasingly popular. And of course, it's the antithesis to the idea of fast fashion, which is based on buying lots, um, not necessarily spending much time choosing and getting rid of it pretty quickly. So slow fashion is actually based on trying to buy less taking a lot of time to choose so considering what we're going to buy so that we you know make the right choices we know we're going to wear something it's going to last a long time and make it last so it's sort of a philosophy really of you know quality over quantity and there's this lovely diagram here about this idea it's a it's a take on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so it's saying the biarchy of needs, and it suggests ways in which we can reduce our consumption. And the first one, of course, is use up what you've got. And there's been increased campaigns for um, education of teaching children in schools how to repair their clothing. Um, because it's figured that the more that we enable people to uh, fix their clothing, the longer it will last. I have to say, I am one to get out the old needle and thread of an evening and fix this jumper I've got here. I, d I dread to tell, I don't want to tell you how old it is. It was from All Saints many, many years ago. And I have, I've got so many little holes in it that I've ended up fixing. I shouldn't be telling this because my colleagues are watching and then all know. Um, but just getting a needle and thread out and being able to fix some holes, it's meant that I've been able to have that jumper for years. Whereas before it would have just, I don't know, got sent to a charity shop or got ended up in the bin maybe, heaven forbid, I hate the thought of that happening, but it makes things last longer. So I like this um, idea of men more bin less and there are lots of other things that people are doing like trying to there's rental economies in fashion now where you can rent your clothes from certain um, rental fashion retailers there's huge huge secondhand economies for clothing not just in thrift shores and charity shops and you know retro cool charity shops but just on ebay and the rise of depop and vintage and people trying to you know reuse their clothes get a bit of money for it and also make sure it doesn't end up in the bin and then of course lastly it says buy so of course sustainable and ethical uh, fashion brands are you know for the most part very good and it's very good that they are developing the best thing that we can do to begin with is just to try and downsize the amount that we're buying um, to try and like give our clothes longer um, lives to begin with as well so I've tried to cover quite a lot in this talk because, um, like I said, there's so much that you could say when it comes to uh, geographies and fashion. Um, and if you are really interested, I would I would have a look at our Co Coventry website and, you know, 
we because I do this module called shop to job so I was saying where I explore this in a lot more detail but I really hope that I've managed to get across some of the key geographical issues and talked about how if we consider our objects or our clothes as having these geographical lives we can look at those and try and uncover um, those stories that our clothes might tell us to show you these really huge social environmental costs and fashion industry um, but I've also hoped to show you that although <laughs> there is some very serious issues in the fashion industry, um, there is there is hope and there is uh, increasing collective action and consumer action and, um, you know, pull, pushes on government as well to uh, encourage fashion to be more sustainable. And I think that will only get stronger is that sort of the discourse of climate change and, and the awareness of it um, becomes stronger and people are really beginning to understand the huge impacts of fast fashion. And also I hope to show um, things that you can do sort of on an everyday basis as individual people. There's just small actions that we can all do like um, washing on, you know, washing on lower temperatures and just being really careful with what we buy and um, um, maybe not just, you know, just really thinking about it and repairing what we have and things like that. And that all those little things all together make a really big difference. So um, if anyone has any questions for me, um, please do ask them. I think Jade might come back now, hopefully. Yes, you're there and you all heard me. <laughs> That's good. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much for that, Amber. That was fantastic. Uh, just really insightful, interesting, but also very relatable for all of us because like you said we all have to wear clothing so yeah. <laughs> it's something that's hopefully given a lot of us um something to think about and we've had um quite a lot of comments and questions come in particularly in the last um 20 minutes actually so okay. a lot of people really um really interested in it um I've got a really good comment actually that just came in um a couple of minutes ago from someone who's actually given up uh, fast fashion themselves in 2019 and they said that they um the, your talk really hammered home the importance of of what they've done and um they just oh. find it really engaging and informative and thank you for that so oh, that's, that's so <laughs> nice well yeah. if that person's still listening well done <laughs> And that's that's great. <laughs> that's it. And it's also nice of me to think, oh, well, people are, you know, really engaged with this and thinking about it and making positive actions as well. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, it's good to know that there's a lot more people already have heard of this and are starting yeah. to, to make sort of positive moves towards it. Um, in terms of questions, then, uh, had a few questions about um, whether there was any affordable alternatives for people trying to avoid fast fashion businesses so a lot of questions really about the cost um, oh, of fast yeah. fashion and how we might prevent um, this two-class system in which people with lower incomes cannot afford um, yeah. what you refer to as the slow fashion and maybe your suggestions for that yeah um so that's a really really good question and it's something i talk about quite a lot of my lectures in this and the idea of financial exclusion so we talk about um this and how it's really difficult because there are a lot of new ethical and sustainable fashion retailers but it can be more expensive obviously because of the cost that goes into paying higher wages and things like that so in terms of you know trying to negate that divide i think um Firstly, sustainable ethical fashion can be more, um, uh, it can be easier to access if you're quite savvy. So from a personal note, I'm a big fan of the people tree sale. <laughs> so you can, you know, so if you're if you're a little bit uh, a little bit careful, um, you can sort of check out what companies there are out there and have a look at that. If you go onto the ethical the ethicalconsumer.org, they have lots of suggestions of um, what sort of companies are, and you can be a little bit savvy and and have a look at things. But I think you know there isn't an easy answer to that because there is an issue. With that and especially with that quality over quantity argument like how can people access the quality if they're not able to access it in to begin with 
Um, there are, you know, methods and ways of being quite savvy, I think, of doing things like secondhand shopping. That's something I do quite a lot of. So look for like good brands and get things. Because if people are really just, you know, buying something and wearing it once, there is so much amazing secondhand fashion out there that you go to. Um, really good charity shops. And second, I know a lot of my students do this. They like go to like cool charity shops or special like fashion sales where people put in and buy things there's the power of second hand because you can save an absolute fortune as well you can do the sort of swap um sites as well and the the shops as well where you can provide some of your own clothing and swap yeah for, for other items so you're getting new items keeping up with maybe fashion trends but um not not buying new new products yeah and you can and you can also if you like learn a few basic sewing skills you can be quite clever in what you create um another tip is also um looking for things that are quite um i'm trying to think of the word uh, that you can use in different ways um so i did this six uh, there's a, a company called label behind the label not a company a charity sorry and they do the six items challenge where you're challenged to you wear six items of clothes for six weeks um okay. and i did this and and so this this bloom and jump this is you know i wore this but it's amazing because you can wear it in all these different ways and you can wrap it around like a ballet jump or you can hang it down and you can put it around so thinking of things that you can wear in different ways is quite good because then you might buy something that's a little bit more expensive if you can but then you can repurpose it and refashion it which is quite nice as well being a little bit more creative yeah more and it, yeah I found it really fun actually doing it because I was started to wear things in ways I didn't know they could be worn I was wearing things inside out and upside down and you know, like all these different things but it's quite good fun yeah I think as well the whole idea of um like sewing and mending clothing as well has been a lost a little bit within within our generation and younger generations yeah. and that's something as well that I think yeah um, and it's so easy as different. well if you know and I think that will be picked up more as as well um I really do and I and I hope in answer to the original question I hope as this becomes so much more important to people fashion might have to become naturally more sustainable and ethical and that therefore it might be a bit more accessible mm -hmm. as well but there are careful things you can do um like buying things like staples and trying to you know don't go and buy a really expensive poncho or something that you'll only wear once like if you are gonna have don't have huge amounts to spend you know if you are gonna get buy like a really something really good like a pair of jeans and you just wear it all the time and so the cost per wear can make it a bit more worth it yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we've had other questions about, um, particularly online retailers. So um, one person here has asked about your thoughts on Shein. I think that's how you pronounce it, Shein. Um, I've heard of the company myself, but it's uh, it's very cheap and quite popular now, um, but supposedly very unethical. So I don't know if you could um, <laughs> your thoughts. The thing is, I mean, yeah, it's a bit difficult, that one, because I don't want to just sort of bash particular retailers um, but I think I do have huge concerns <laughs> about this rise of kind of online only massive fashion retailers and things being sold at extremely low prices and I really worry that it's creating a mindset for people where it's just normal that things mm -hmm. cost very much um, and that sort of relates back to the last question because it's so normalized that a t-shirt might cost a, like four pounds or something but it shouldn't do and for like uh, the generations before us things just were more expensive and people were used to spending more on clothes so mm -hmm. yeah so I'm not I'm not gonna if you don't mind I might not go into too much individual detail but I have big concerns <laughs> shall yeah. I say yes um, do you think in terms of the pandemic as well that there has been a relationship there in terms of the rise of online online retailers or yeah you of that? well I think that um people like ASOS saw huge surges in people buying more things because of course people couldn't go shopping physically but also in things like loungewear so they had these huge spike in sales of people wanting comfier things um 
around the house and things like that so I think maybe so there is that side but also but because people weren't going out as much I mean you know there was maybe less of a need to always be buying new things yeah. it's like oh I need a new you know this to go out on Friday well, no one's going out on Friday so there's a shift but I I would be really interested to see what, you know, if there's going to be, there'll probably be some big retail reports that come out in the next few months about, and when this is all, when it's over, it'll be really interesting to see how things changed an awful yeah. lot. But I like to think people are at home busy mending their clothes and that's what people yeah. can do. You can always hope, yeah. <laughs> uh, you talked a little bit about um, the tragedy that happened at Rana Plaza. Mm -hmm. And I wondered just from that, whether there have been any changes in policies or regulations um, in some of the standards of clothing production and generally how, not so much the outsourcing because that can be more difficult to, to monitor, but how is it that many of these, these companies that are, um, I guess in, in some way legally, um, working and producing this clothing how are they able to continue to get away with this and have there been any changes since the Rana Plaza um it's really tricky because there'll be it's very hard to answer that question because there'll be completely different um requirements in different countries across the world mm -hmm. what I can talk about though is a cultural shift that there has been in terms of large uh, fashion retailers uh, really promoting that idea of transparency. Um, so, for example, Primark, usually you know a pinnacle example of fast fashion, they um, have all this stuff on their website where you can pinpoint what factories the, the clothes are made in, and it talks about you know what what kind of situations there are there, and these are kind of certified factories. And you might find that you know when there are these scandals happen, then suddenly you know the company will go, oh no, we didn't know that was happening, and close things down and things like that. Unfortunately, the real issue is this: the outsourcing, the elite, kind of the illegal outsourcing, because you, you can say, oh, oh, this factory is producing this, but there really is no control, and there's no form of governmental control on that. And unfortunately, there have been a lot. Um, um, if you might notice, there's a, the link back on this last slide. There's this fixing fashion report there. Um, and there was this amazing lobbying group that was <laughs> lobbying the government to try and teach, um, put uh, repairing on the curriculum and things like uh, uh, fashion tax and all these things. But it all got um, rejected um, by the government because the, the issue is fashion creates money, is a business and uh, governments can be unwilling to try and uh, in any way hamper businesses. Um, but I am, again, I'm very hopeful because I think the way things are going with environmental concerns, this will be higher on people's agendas and people will really, because people think fashion, it's, it's fashion, it's not serious and people are realising it's serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, comments about social media then, to what extent would you say that the social media and this celebrity culture is responsible for, for quite a drive in, in fast fashion? Yeah, well, I can only work, this is my opinion here, um, but there, I mean, there have been an awful lot of academic studies that have been done on things like Instagram. So if you go into Google Scholar and look at fashion Instagram, there have been huge, there have been so many studies done on this. Personally, I think it has just created a, you do hear a lot about people not wanting to be say, seen in the same picture. So it's not just, it used to be, oh, I don't want to go out. You know, I was wearing a red shirt last week. I don't want to wear the same one again. It's like, oh, well, I was photographed in this. I can't be seen in it again because we've got this continual photograph story of our lives. And I think it does put pressure on people um, to buy more. And I think we are in a very visual culture. Uh, you, you know, it used to be say like, Jay, when, when we were growing up, we might've seen you know reading like a magazine and that's where you'd see fashion or on the tv and now it's just people's lives every day and it's I imagine I mean I talk a little bit about this in when I do a form of this lecture I talk about the human cost of fashion but I also talk about that in terms of mental health and people in western economies and these like constant bombarded images of perfect bodies and perfect fashion bodies and media and I think people are under a lot of pressure and it, it 
ultimately it's so easy to purchase as well because you can click on it and literally there'll be oh you like this jumper and literally click on the link here's where you can get it from from this company press a button and it's so easy just to buy and try and you know buy be a part of that so I I don't think it's made things any better no I completely agree and I think like you said it's we were lucky in a way to have have just missed out on that the the pressures that come with with social yeah, media yeah. so I can understand why a lot of people in their teens and 20s particularly who maybe engage with um social media to a greater extent then there is this this pressure like you said to to look and dress in a particular way and that's that's maybe fueled this a bit further but yeah it's really um, interesting discussion. A lot of this you tie into to a few of the, the modules that you, you cover as well in, in terms of the, the idolised body and um, your your work in sex, drugs and rock and roll, which is one of Amber's other, other modules. Uh, I've got sort of two more questions. Um, one really that I, I've kind of posed here in regard to um, what you talked about briefly about the um, disposal of clothes overseas and you didn't have a chance to really elaborate oh, right. on okay. discussion. so I wondered if you could do yeah, that. Yeah of course. Okay so a lot of our clothing ends up overseas so you know if you go into like the tip or you know there might be one in your local co-op I know there is one in mine and they like kind of they say like humanitarian aid or these you know bags that get left on your doorstep and things. Um, so a lot of the time they go to these big sorting centres and they get shipped overseas um a lot ends up in um a lot of areas of western africa on the coast and things like that and it, a lot of academics argue that they are destroying local economies and local fashion economies because suddenly they have all these sort of charitable donations come in and people think they're amazing and, and they're, they're relatively cheap and people buy all these massive bundles of clothes to sell on and use and people can't believe that these items have not been worn and they've been thrown away um, but they can have quite negative effects because so environmentally I suppose it's it's helpful because they're not going into landfill good but then there's huge transportation costs and another carbon footprint of the clothes going somewhere else and then there's these local diverse economy, say maybe like local women creating lovely clothes out of local fabrics. And suddenly they're relatively expensive compared to these huge imports of um, these clothes. So it's not an ideal solution um, and it's not black and white and it has some benefits, but some negatives as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So quite, yeah, again, another aspect of this that um, a lot of you could, do a bit of reading further on because I know you provided a lot of really interesting links and connections and recommended texts throughout this as well so um, hopefully you'll be able to draw upon that um, obviously get in touch with Amber as well if you've got any any further questions on how you might access these. Um, just to finish off then uh, a question that says do you think there's a way to globally move past unethical and un unsustainable um, means of uh, producing clothes or are we all doomed? <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, no. Um, so I just thought maybe, because you did sort of put a bit of a positive spin on it towards the end. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, there are, as I outlined, there were some huge issues, but I do, I do really believe that there is so much increased awareness now and especially the younger generation will have so much more an awareness of the geographies of their clothes and and that's normally where the most change happens because if people aren't buying things there's not a demand for sort of cheap unethical clothing I'd also like to see in an ideal world sort of greater governmental controls um, again it's very difficult because it's talking about hundreds of countries you know the, the fashion had produced in so it's difficult for a blanket to me to say a blanket statement um, but it is just one of these issues of the wider globalization because we are so disconnected from the things that we are made it's really hard to see issues but we are seeing big cultural shifts 
in terms of fashion more people are embracing like local production and things like that so and um, there's a rise of uh, kind of more independent fashion retailers that are utilizing sort of local labor for example so uh just an example i've interviewed um uh, the CEO of a company called Deacon and Blue, and they make swimsuits out of recycled uh, plastic, essentially that comes from old fishing nets and from the sea. And it's a really good fabric to reuse. But they produce everything in London, and they pay a living London wage. And there, I just think there might be kind of more companies as it becomes more and more popular. Um, so no, we're not all doomed because we are more aware, and it links to that thing about. Uh, fashion revolution saying you know transparency so our awareness and that encourages accountability and therefore change I think that's a really nice place to, to <laughs> yeah. end all then gives us a little positive spin towards the end I've had so many really lovely comments as well oh. um, that I'll share with you after this um people just find the talk really fantastic so insightful and for those of you who've been asking how to access this afterwards, it will be made available on the um, Geography webinar page. So you will be able to watch this at a later point. Um, so yeah, thank you again very much for today, Amber. It's my um, pleasure. Thank you for everyone that came, sort of virtually came to listen. It's really nice. Yeah, no, it was, it was, yeah, so interesting. I could talk to you all day about this because I'm, I'm so interested in it myself. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was a pleasure to be able to, to host it as well. Oh, um, just a reminder, if anybody does want to join um, as, as a subscriber to this channel, just to get in touch with um, Craig. So that's craig.lashford.coventry.ac.uk. And we have our talk, um, of course, next Wednesday again at 4.30 with Dr. Michelle Farrell. Thank you very much, everyone. Right, bye. bye. bye.